Hello and welcome to another edition of Resistance TV. What's the role of faith in modern politics, do you think? I mean, it used to be said that the Labour Party owed more to Methodism than Marxism. And there's certainly been a symbiotic connection with faith throughout the Labour movement's history. George Lovelace, for example, who led the Tall Puddle Martyrs, was a Methodist lay preacher. And Keir Hardy, who was the first leader of the Labour Party, was also a lay preacher who was actually driven to political activism by his faith. And we've often seen religious leaders intervening in the political process too. And the Archbishop of Canterbury has suggested that following Jesus means getting involved in politics to help serve the common good. The Faith in the City report, some of our older viewers might remember it, when Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister, unambiguously stated that rising poverty in Britain's inner cities were down to her government's policies. But then on the other hand, uh, if you go back uh, some time, the Church of England was described by Benjamin Disraeli as the Tory party at prayer. And more recently, the chief rabbi, the late uh, Ephraim Mervis, controversially intervened in the 2019 general election to attack Jeremy Corbyn. Mervis made some wild and entirely false accusations about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, and he claimed that Jeremy Corbyn had sanctioned the alleged anti-Semitism. Anyway, I'm delighted then to uh, welcome the Reverend Dr. Stephen Sizer onto the show this evening to talk about the role of faith in modern politics, including its role in responding to imperialism. Stephen's an outspoken supporter of the Palestinians, which has actually made him a target for the Israel lobby. So, uh, hi, Stephen. Welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you. It's good to be with you, Chris. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us. I wonder perhaps if we could start. I guess a lot of people will have followed what happened to you, but there will be a lot of people who are perhaps uh, unaware. And uh, maybe it'd be worth perhaps starting, given that you've been a, an outspoken supporter of uh, the Palestinian cause. If you could just sort of tell us what happened to you inside the Church of England. Well, I've, I've been an Anglican clergyman for... Um since I was 30, so that's 40 years. And um, I got involved in the Middle East through a visit to Palestine with a really good friend, Garth Hewitt, who's a Christian singer. And uh, it really opened my eyes to the, the plight of the Palestinians. We were under the curfew several nights. We were running, um, running the gauntlet through checkpoints. Um, hidden on the back seat of a taxi to get in and out of uh, closed military areas to perform these concerts. And, um, you know, my empathy for the struggle the Palestinians were facing came oh, at least 20 years ago. And that led me to do some uh, theological research into Christian Zionism, uh, which is the dominant form of Zionism. It always has been. It preceded Jewish Zionism by 50 years and is 10 times larger now than Jewish Zionism as a movement. So when you think Zionism, you should really think in terms of Christian Zionism. So I did my PhD critiquing Western foreign policy and how religion and politics were fused in, in the colonial era and how, in a sense, Israel was simply an extension of European colonialism in the Middle East, uh, you know, an untimely born child. You know, most of the um, most of the colonized countries were, were looking for independence after the Second World War, and here was Israel being created rather artificially through the United Nations. Um, and that's got me into a lot of hot water, particularly with uh, Christian Zionists who uh, don't like the way I've challenged their theological understanding of scripture. Um, but it's made me more and more determined to campaign for human rights, in particular the rights of Palestinians. Uh, 20 years ago, I was asked to write a book for World Vision on um, Israel-Palestine. And I'd read Yuri Davis's book, Israel, the Apartheid State, which came out in the 70s. And I, I, you know, I, I looked for easy sermon outlines and I thought of A, B, C, D, E, A, Apartheid, B, Bantustan, C, Concealment, the way the occupation is hidden from Western media, D, Distortion, the way that they use distortion to... Uh, to, to suggest Israel's democracy and e uh, ethnic cleansing. Um, unfortunately, uh, 20 years ago, World Vision couldn't cope with the word a apartheid, and so it's been uh, quite an interesting um, journey to see how, only relatively recently, the word is 
is becoming more commonly used to describe what's been blindingly obvious for the last 50 years. Well, indeed. I mean, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu actually described it as worse than the apartheid that they experienced in in South Africa. But uh, I mean, how? I mean, you, you were penalised, weren't you, in you know, by the Church of England for the for the stance that, that you took? I mean, what sort of support did you get from you know within within the uh, church for the position that you'd taken? I mean, did you get a lot of solidarity, or, or were people? Sort of keeping the head down, or indeed, did they feel that you'd overstep them all? It's it certainly divided my friends and made me a lot of new friends too. It began in around 2012. I was um, a, a complaint was made against me by the board of deputies of British Jews because of various things I had done at the time, uh, outspoken uh, criticisms of Israel's policy toward the Palestinians. Um, and my bishop at the time, um, Christopher Hill, Bishop of Guildford, very wisely uh, decided on um, conciliation. Now, conciliation suggests that there's there's things may or may not have gone wrong, but let's talk it through. And so that forced the board of deputies to sit down with me and agree where we went, move forward. And we agreed uh, basically what I'd proposed, which was if you've got a problem with me, come to me privately. And if I deal with it, fine. If I don't, then go public, go, go to the church or go public. Uh, because that's the process of dealing with unresolved tensions that the New Testament emphasizes. You know, deal with it privately and then take two or three guys along. If you don't listen to them, then you then you go public. Because the Board mm -hmm. of Deputies wasn't doing that. They made their first complaint very public, even before the church had received it. So that was resolved by conciliation, and we thought that was the end of it. Then I went to Iran to do some teaching, and the Board of Deputies made a complaint again to my bishop because they said he shouldn't be going to a country that has threatened to annihilate Israel. Well, that was that, that, that's the way they interpreted it. But again, we, we went pushed back, and we said to the, uh, the Board of Deputies, it's inappropriate for a, a Jewish organization to tell a Christian minister where he can and can't go in the world to uh, to fulfill this Christian ministry, I moved to um, I moved to Winchester five years ago, and so they decided to make another complaint. This time to my bishop in Winchester, Tim Dakin. He decided it was time to go to a tribunal. The board of deputies' complaint was basically that I had committed repeated acts of anti-Semitism, and I had um, offended the Jewish community. It took four years from the complaint to the tribunal. They couldn't find a single word of mine out of hundreds of sermons online, hundreds of articles, my books. They couldn't find a single word that was deemed anti-Semitic. And they didn't or couldn't or wouldn't present a single witness to say at the tribunal that I'd offended them. On my side, I had at least 40 witnesses. I had archbishops, bishops, rabbis, uh, Jewish academics, human rights activists, clergy. Uh, Muslim leaders all defending me and repudiating the allegations. So we were confident that this complaint would be uh, rejected. It took four years. And then after the tribunal, it took another six months before they published their findings. And it, it basically stood or fell on the IHRA definition. They were trying to apply it retrospectively over 15 years. Uh, the expert witness, Tony Lerman, who's a Jewish academic at the tribunal, insisted it was a defective uh, definition. It falls at the first hurdle of definition because it's indefinite. You yeah. know, it, it contains the word may. So it's not a definition. And so it's been thoroughly discredited, as you probably know. So their, their case fell, basically. So they, they took the line of, well, it's not anti-Semitism we're going after. It's conduct unbecoming. And so they, they dredged up four events that they alleged was conduct unbecoming. One of them was wearing a clerical collar at a meeting with a leader of Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. Um, mm. I, I'd had my book translated to Arabic. I was in Lebanon. I was asked to meet this guy. I, I walked into this room. There was uh, Sheikh Farouk. Um, we had half an hour together. His last question to me, and it's always the last question that's the most important one. He said, what would you advise Hezbollah, Stephen? And I was blown away by that. What, what's a leader of Hezbollah asking a Christian priest for advice? Yeah. 
So I said, release the Israeli captives. You worship a compassionate, merciful God, show compassion and mercy, release them and beat the Israelis morally as well as militarily. Invite them to retaliate and release your prisoners, but don't trade them like animals. Don't barter mm. for them. Take the moral high ground. And I felt that was the Christian thing to do. So ironically, I was censured for interceding for Jewish prisoners, soldiers, before a Muslim leader in southern Lebanon. But mm. the irony is I was condemned for wearing a collar but the bishop at the time in the Middle East, Bishop Ria Abu Lasal, who's a good friend, I'm his chaplain, he said, that's that's the opposite of what we would expect. He said, in the Middle East, you have to wear a clerical collar. If you're at a meeting with religious or political leaders, you're a priest, you, you act like a priest. If you don't, they'll think you're a spy or something. So oh, cool. the tribunal got it wrong completely. But um, they, they imposed on me a 12-year ban from uh, leading or preaching services. I'm retired, so they can't take anything away from me that I haven't already given up. No. So it was a token punishment, but um, I've had a lot of support. Uh, Tony Lerman said it's an indelible stain on the Church of England. Jeff Halper, the human rights activist, said it was uh, an inquisition. What are Jews and what is the Church of England doing reintroducing inquisitions to England? No, no evidence, no witnesses but a 12 year ban that's uh... well you, you, your story um, your your story stephen is is very familiar and uh, not in terms of the church but just in terms of other people i mean there's people like professor david miller for example myself yeah. you know was 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 sort of drummed out of the yeah. labor party not not for any anti-semitism but for uh, in my case a pattern of behavior in in um, in uh, david's case uh, for not meeting the standards required or expected by the university of bristol there'd been a big two inquiries qc made inquiries we both no. concluded that he he'd done absolutely nothing wrong and had said nothing uh, anti-semitic no. so, so so it is a very familiar story but just in more general terms though in regards to the role of faith in in, in politics i mentioned in the introduction there that uh, certainly as far as the labor movement has been concerned that there's been a you know Labour has been sort of intertwined, really, in many ways, with with uh, the uh, sort of uh, faith uh, and with with, with religion. Um, you know, people like I've already mentioned, you know, George uh, Lovelace, the uh, leader of the Tall Puddle Martyrs, and you know, more recently, Justin Welby, saying that you know, well, if you follow the teachings of, of Jesus, you you have to get involved in politics to to serve the the common good. I mean, how influential. Do you think, uh, you know, faith actually is in politics these days? And is it, do you think, as influential across the piece, across the political spectrum, or does it have more influence on one side than the other, do you reckon? Um, if I just take you back to your, your, your um, comparison of me with David Miller and yourself and Jenny Tong and others, I think part of their strategy is to pick off one priest, one politician, one academic, because then that, ensures everyone else keeps their head down. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Our token examples, persona non grata within the church, within parliament, within academia, um, I think that is that that's part of their agenda. But to answer your question, I mean, yes, um, uh, Justin Welby um, has called for greater involvement. Unfortunately, the week before the last general election, he intervened condemning Jeremy Corbyn supporting the chief rabbi, which was an unprecedented act, which if I had done it would have been grounds for discipline because clergy are allowed to engage in politics. And, you know, I would urge my congregations every four years to vote, but I wouldn't yes. presume to tell them who to vote for. That would be party politics and quite inappropriate for a clergyman to do. So he was completely out of order to do that. I'm sure he was pushed into doing so by the Board of Deputies or others. Um, he also said in 2017 that the church is institutionally racist. Well, I think my tribunal has confirmed that because mm. they've sided with racists against an anti-racist. Well, that's true. Um, yeah. you know, at the core of my faith, when I first became a Christian at university, I was uh, really overwhelmed by the examples of people like Martin Luther King, uh, even Malcolm Muggeridge, and we got involved in boycotting Barclays Bank because of its involvement in South Africa. 
We were advocating for the Nagas in India. They were a minority, a Christian minority were being persecuted. So that, that and I was bullied as a kid at school. So underneath my Christian faith is the, is the experience of, uh, of, of wanting to engage where I see people being, people being abused. Yeah. The Christian scriptures emphasize, and Jesus especially, that we should identify with the poor, the marginalized, the abused, the widows, the orphans. So that's what drives me. And that's what makes intervention uncomfortable for those in establishment positions. And sadly, mm. the Church of England is, is an established institution engaged in politi uh, po parliament, in politics. So I do see it as the, 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 the religious arm of the Conservative Party. Um, my, you know, the prophetic strand or the prophetic uh, element of the Christian faith, which speaks out against injustice, that um, calls for um, justice, for um, reconciliation, for the rights of the oppressed, for, for the marginalized and the abused, um, takes courage and it's costly and often leads to martyrdom, whether it's social martyrdom or, or, or physical, you know, literal. No, indeed. It's interesting, though, isn't it, that um, often you get the sort of far right, um, you know, invoking a religion, particularly in the United States of America. Um, how does that work? Uh, because that well, seems ca counterintuitive to me. I mean, f for me, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I was a Christian. I, I'm not anymore. I've got to say I've, we have cards on the table. But um, for me, it seems to me that, you know, if you're a Christian or indeed any faith for that matter, you, you would, like as you were just saying, you would you would sort of um, your, your your focus would be, and your support would be, your sympathies would lie with the with the oppressed and and, and the marginalised, which sort of pushes you down the direction of the kind of left of centre sort of political identity. But I mean, you mentioned the established church, you know, is I mean, and what Benjamin Disraeli talks about being the Tory Party of prayer. We see we, uh, prayer we see in the United States. Yeah, that's the conundrum there, isn't it? I mean, how, how do you explain that, do you think? Well, religion has been co-opted by, by um, those who want to defend their, their claims and their rights. So we have Christianity in the States is, is being exploited by supremacists um, in order to justify um, their worldview, which basically says God is on our side against our enemies. It's a dualism, a Manichaean theology that says there's the good guys and the bad guys. We're the good guys and they're the bad guys. There's a story in the book of Joshua where Joshua is confronted by, uh, by an angel. He doesn't know it's an angel. And, uh, and he says, are you on our side or, or their side? And the angel says, neither. I'm on the Lord's side. Whose side are you on? Um, so it's it's with God on our side is is embedded in in many many cultures, not just Christian cultures like uh, South Africa, where the Bible was used to justify apartheid. Um, yes. we see the same in India within Hinduism. Uh, we see the same within Islam, uh, and we certainly see it within Judaism within Zionism. Zionism is the enemy of the Jews because it 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 is a form of supremacism that says. God has given us this land. We have a divine right to the land and you can be exterminated or expelled because God gave us the land. So religion has been weaponized uh, within all the main religions, but especially within Christianity to justify uh, the colonization and the uh, subjugation of, quote, inferior peoples, you know, whether it's Native Americans, uh, the uh, Latin American uh, peoples. Africans, Asians, whoever. So it was a weapon used by the uh, the colonists. And you mentioned the early trade unionists. Their their implacable enemies were not fellow politicians. They were church leaders. The church was co-opted by the state to justify crushing the trade union movement. So it was a a dissident movement among the Methodists, among the non-conformists, who did not have power. But they had uh, conviction and they had courage and they had tenacity. And, and that's why we're so grateful to the, uh, the originators of the trade union movement. No, indeed. And um, I know certainly in my experience, uh, having uh, 
worked with and, and got to know a number of uh, faith leaders, uh, particularly in the Anglican Church. Uh, they've been almost invariably very concerned about imperialism and, and, have, and, have, and have actively campaigned on, on that issue and used the, you know, the, the pulpit, as it were, to, to proselytise really about you know, the plight of um, peoples in developing countries essentially at the hands of, um, of the West and you know, corporate capitalism, et cetera. I mean, do you think that the, the church has, through that process, been able to uh, influence policy or, or have they been just sort of whistling in the wind in the end, do you think? Well, the church was very influential in, um, forgive me for saying the church, Christians, were very influential yes. in the uh, ending of the slave trade, William Wilberforce, for example, but they were a minority. Um, similarly, uh, with segregation, it was a minority of black Christian leaders, Martin Luther King and others. Similarly, in South Africa, um, with Desmond Tutu and uh, Nelson Mandela and others. And, uh, and so you have a minority that is speaking out on behalf of the poor, on behalf of the oppressed, um, but the establishment has co-opted religion, be it Christianity or whatever, to justify uh, their survival and their continued um, claim on whether it's land, wealth or whatever. So I think, yes, uh, you know, I've been inspired by people like Trevor Huddleston um, and, and Desmond Tutu um, and Martin Luther King, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer who challenged Nazism in Germany. Um, you know, he ended up a martyr as well. Uh, but when you, when you touch on Israel, it's almost like it's in another league because mm. you encounter um, a kind of very simplistic theology that says Israel is Israel is Israel. Israel was God's chosen people in the Old Testament. Um, Look how the church has treated Jews in history, appalling anti-Semitism. So today, Christians are very nervous about either guilt for the Holocaust or fear of, of being accused of being anti-Semitic. It's particularly mm. true in Germany and uh, in, oh, yeah. in some European countries. Um, we have a very hard time challenging the church to speak out on behalf of the Palestinians. Um, mm. And uh, but, you know, there are in the UK, you've got Kairos, Sabeel Kairos, uh, Embrace the Middle East, uh, the Balfour Project. Uh, there are small uh, Christian organizations calling for a change in in Britain's approach to the Middle East and particular to Palestine. That's why we're campaigning for one democratic state, uh, because we now have one apartheid state. There is no hope for a two state solution. But again, these yeah. are. Minorities, small groups, uh, but um, we are confident that history is on our side. The God of justice is on our side. What I mean, you mentioned, uh, Stephen, that often it's not the established church leaders necessarily that uh, you know take a lead, with some notable exceptions. But nevertheless, you know, people of faith, in your case, of Christian faith, but but obviously other other faiths as well. Um, take a lead in in you know in pushing for change and, and speaking up for the oppressed. Um, what what can what can ordinary members of the congregation, as it were, uh, you know, if I can put it in sort of political parlance, you know, the rank and file um, uh, in the uh, in the in the Christian church, and indeed in other in other faiths for that matter. I mean, if they don't feel that the you know the church is is actually uh, speaking up as it should be. I mean, what, what what can they do? Is there anything that they can do to actually push for change, or should they just sort of just do what they can on their own volition? Well, I'm a pastor at heart, and and therefore, you know, your question really uh, it, it excites me because I want to change the paradigm within our society, our country, and the church in particular on justice issues, in particular on Palestine. Too often. Churches focus on band aid theology, which is let's give money to help with the poor, with uh, the refugees, and so on. But what we, you know, th that's dealing with the symptoms, not dealing with the causes. Um, so 
I've given a lot of my time and energy to, to producing simple, popular, easy resources, simple resources, which Christians uh, can use to understand what the Bible says about these issues and then how they can use it actively to, to be change agents. Um, so if you go to my website, stephensizer.com, go down to books, you'll find numerous resources there uh, with, on, on apartheid, a biblical critique of apartheid, for example, uh, biblical critique of, uh, of, uh, of uh, anti-Semitism uh, and Zionism and so on. Um, the, the organizations I mentioned, Sabil Kairos uh, and Embrace the Middle East, uh, ICAD, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, the Islamic Human Rights Commission, uh, Jew, uh, Jew, um, Jewish Network for Palestine, JNP. These are organizations I work with closely uh, because we're committed to, to providing resources that will enable people in our community to be involved in change. And I think once you see the truth, it's hard to unsee it. No, you know, once you've seen something, it's hard to forget it, hard to, to, to pretend you haven't seen it. And that's what motivates people. When they see children being targeted in Palestine, uh, you know, an, another mortality here, another live ammunition used against this teenager here, or uh, detention without trial, or um, home demolitions where schools are demolished because they're in the wrong place, where Israel wants to build another settlement, steal more land. It gets people angry, and then they're more likely to write to their MP, write to their church leaders. So at the moment, we are encouraging Christians to challenge the Archbishop of Canterbury and the leaders right. of the church to acknowledge that Israel is an apartheid state. Mm. Amnesty International, War on Want, Bethlehem, um, they've all come out with major reports detailing the parallels between South Africa and Israel, between segregation. The wall in Hebrew is called Hefrada. Hefrada in Hebrew means separate. It's exactly the same word as apartheid. Dutch Afrikaner, yeah. apart, means separate. And that's mm -hmm. what they're doing. They're separating Jews from Palestinians. But they're separating them on Palestinian territory. They're taking as much land as possible and corralling the Palestinians into bantustans, into, uh, into ghettos uh, for cheap labor or, or, or to force them out when it becomes intolerable. So mm -hmm. we're, we're in the business of producing resources. So recently I put together four Bible studies on Israeli apartheid so that churches could use them with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other to say, this is what our faith tells us we should believe and do if we care for those who are being abused, marginalized, irrespective of their ethnicity. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we could go on about refugees and the way everyone's opened their homes to Ukrainian refugees, uh, but we uh, deny <laughs> Uh, safe routes for refugees from other countries. It comes down yeah. to their skin colour and their yeah. ethnicity, which is racism. Of course. No, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, as far as uh, the situation in Palestine is concerned, I mean, Israel, of course, when it was even first created, was created by essentially stealing the land of the Palestinian people. Three quarters of a million people, as you'll know, were uh, evicted and forced out of the homeland. Many were, were massacred. Um, and things have only kind of got worse since 1967 and and beyond, where they've completely atomized the the uh, the West Bank now, and Gaza is the the largest open air prison in the world. But but moving a little closer to to home, uh, Stephen, I mentioned in the introduction the uh, Faith in the City report uh, back in the day. Uh, it's going back some time, and Margaret Thatcher it doesn't seem that long to me. But of course, once you get older, <laughs> you know, the time, yeah, it sort of, uh, yeah, yeah, each year seems to, uh, yeah, go go a lot quicker. It only seems like uh, yesterday, really, to to me. But that was quite um, a, a controversial move, it seemed, at the time. I mean, would you say that, uh, the, you know, the people, you know, in your congregation and so on, and just, just you know, regular uh, uh, parishioners should so, for example, get involved in, 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 in the trade union movement, you know, become a trade unionist. If, if we're going to, I mean, what does Justin Welby mean when, he, you know, he talks about getting involved in politics to help serve the common good? How, how, do, you, how, does, how do you do that? Is it, is it through becoming a, 
uh, a member of a trade union, community organisation, political parties, and, and arguing for change that way. But what does it mean? And, and what, what would you say on that? It means all of those things. You know, I, in my congregations, I, I encourage church members to vote, to join parties, to engage in politics. Um, um, you know, that's essential if we are to be change agents, be an influence for good. Um, I'm in Southampton and for a couple of years I was very active with a charity working with refugees and encouraging churches to, to be uh, English teachers, to help refugees learn English, uh, to be oh, visitors, okay. to visit them uh, in prison, to visit them um, in their hostels and um, help them with their forms because everything's in English and they need a lawyer to, to complete their application for, uh, for, for residence. So we were, we were involved in encouraging churches to be involved in that, but working with mosques and synagogues as well to encourage other faith groups, because many of our refugees, certainly in our area, are Muslims. And therefore, it's very important that our Muslims locally are part of that welcome and part of the long term engagement uh, with them. And those are very important uh, things to be in, to be involved with, not just voting every four years and local politics perhaps is is even more crucial to be involved with um you know civic groups that are involved in improving the quality of life in our communities so very much so we've got to encourage that and and we've been involved in doing that as much as we can do you think uh, the um uh, faith leaders are doing enough in that regard one of the things i get frustrated about with regard to the labor movement is that i don't feel that the trade unions are doing enough to raise political consciousness to encourage their members. It's a big cohort, so not as big as it used to be. But I think they've still got six or seven million members in the in the country, and uh, that could be a very very powerful block. And I just don't think there's there's enough being done to actually you know raise people's awareness of. Uh, you know the injustices and uh, and the way the system operates and that things don't need to be this way we don't need to have 14 million people living in poverty for example but i just wondered from your perspective uh, stephen in terms of where the uh, uh faith leaders are, are uh, involved i mean are they doing enough could they be doing more or are, are they doing that or do you think even that's 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 an appropriate role for them to be raising political consciousness about that? We can we can all be doing more. So I'm not I'm not throwing mud at particular leaders. Uh, you know, we're all accountable, all responsible for our civic responsibilities and duties. Um, but I think two observations. One is that the media is focused on sound bites, on um, on personalities. So you know, there are probably a handful of bishops that get called for a for a, for a, an interview when there's a topic. Um, and as you know, our political parties have three line whips and expect their MPs to toe the party line. And so there is little scope unless you're an independent or a maverick, um, whether it's inside parliament or, or in a community, to speak out on issues that you feel strongly about, say CMD, nuclear disarmament, or, or, or stop the war coalition. You know, um, it's very hard to, to get a hearing without being... Uh, portrayed as an extremist or a fundamentalist or an eccentric. Um, again, our church leaders, sadly, are always looking over their shoulders at their, they, you know, they, each diocese would have not just an HR department, but a PR department. You know, people who are good at writing press statements, press releases, and getting them to their friendly journalists. Um, so, you know, we've got, we've got mixed motives. People want to be popular. They want to survive the next election so that you've got short termism. We've got our, you know, our, the leaders of our political parties, their focus is on winning the next election, not building yeah. a, a fairer society, uh, a more caring society. Um, you look at the way China is investing its wealth in Africa and other countries, and you see that they're, what, they're following a hundred year plan. They're not looking mm -hmm. for short term returns on investment the way. Uh, Western countries are, and look what's happening. They're basically taking over whole countries and, and you know, getting the raw, raw materials that they need to expand their economy. They have a more enlightened or more pragmatic long-term approach. Um, 
For me, what matters is reflecting daily, what would Jesus do? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? He was, uh, on the one hand, popular, but he was incredibly controversial. Uh, we talk about Jesus meek and mild, but actually when you read the Gospels, you see him, Jesus, mean and wild. He was an uncomfortable person to be around, unsettling, uh, challenging you, probing you. And, uh, and, and therefore, to that extent, I believe the church's role is to be Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Whoever is in power, the church's role, the, the role of faith society is to be the conscience to hold our leaders accountable, whether they be political or religious or whoever, hold them accountable. The only people really doing that today are our journalists. You look at all of the exposures that have happened with, with, with companies, with personalities, they're being, they're being exposed by journalists doing the hard work. Um, yeah, I mean, I, although I think the, the corporate media uh, has fallen down on, on that job as well to a large extent. I mean, there are some yeah. notable exceptions, but I think a lot of that is being done by, in, you know, the independent journalists who are outside of the of the corporate Definitely. mainstream sector in that sense. So, uh, but yes, we, we do need to be to be, uh, be be pushing them and celebrating, I suppose, those you know when 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 they do do that. And as for being Her Majesty's or His Majesty's loyal opposition, I mean, oh, yeah. those of us who are those of us who are Republicans would like to see, you know, as being the, the people's uh, uh, loyal opposition, as it were, <laughs> rather than the uh, His Majesty's. But then that's a, that's another topic. I don't know what your thoughts are about republicanism, but but maybe we'll get into that on an, on another occasion. Mister Stephen, thanks very much indeed for uh, joining us this evening. That's been a really uh, interesting, illuminating uh, conversation. I think we should perhaps come back to it again uh, at a future date if you are up for that. How can people uh, follow you or, or uh, keep up with, with what you do? You've mentioned your website. Are there any other platforms that, that people yeah. can follow your work? Uh, I wouldn't recommend Wikipedia because that's being controlled by my critics. Yes, um, of course. My, I know that feeling. Sorry <laughs> what they put on there about me. You know, I'm yeah, surprised yeah. you're not if you read that. No, I, I, I'm founder and director of a charity called Peacemakers. And you can find that uh, peacemakers.ngo. Uh, we simply seek to be catalysts for peacemaking wherever uh, minorities are persecuted, where justice is denied, human rights are suppressed, or reconciliation is needed. So uh, that's a charity I run, peacemakers.ngo. Again, my Zionist friends have targeted the charity, tried to get the charity commission to withdraw our status, but we, we've survived for five years. We're doing okay. So, yeah, peacemakers.ngo or my website, stephensizer.com, or find me on Facebook. Um, yeah, that's where you'll find my resources. And I hope that you'll find them of, of benefit in, in your own journey. I'm sure uh, we will. And uh, thank you again, Stephen, for taking the time out. We really appreciate it. And thank everybody for watching this evening. All being well, we will hopefully be back next week at the same time at 7pm. So until then, this is Chris Williamson saying bye for now.